that's yeah. I'm gonna try. Hey, where do you where do you live? What state do you live in? I'm in Virginia. Virginia. Okay, good. Because I'm looking at the trees out the window behind you. Yeah. And uh, I yeah. love that. I live in Las Vegas. We have any greenery you see here has a bubbler system attached to it. <laughs> it's, so you uh, you went home every night at the Twenty Books Vegas. Yeah, conference. and the the drive home was miserable because of the F1 race the next week. So they yeah. had roads closed. They had congestion. Uh, any traffic heading for the Las Vegas Strip was gridlocked because they couldn't turn right away onto the uh, onto the Strip. Yeah. So it, it was uh, going home every night was just horrible. Just horrible. Yeah, I I drove cross country because um, before I joined the Marines, I taught I taught in Southwest Kansas and. We bought our house there. Like I said, when I went to boot camp, I was very financially vulnerable. We we had a mortgage in Kansas. Cool. Um, we still do. We still own that house. Do you? It's, Good. A, it's a pretty cheap mortgage as mortgages go <laughs> uh, because property out there is inexpensive. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I wanted to stop and see my house on the way to Vegas. Oh, that's great. And so I, I drove, drove all the way. Um, so I had my car there in Vegas. Most of the conference attendees don't. They no. they fly and then they they're planted at the hotel during the thing. Um, so I I drove out into town to see my cousin, um, and then there was some other reason after that. I think anyway, but yeah, the the traffic was a nightmare. It's always the, it's always tight anyway on a Friday or Saturday and Thursday, Friday, Saturday, but. This week, that week of the conference was just horrendous. It was the sort of thing you just you just go, ah, I don't want to do this ever again. Uh, but it was a good race. I stayed up. Uh, it was uh, on it from 10 to 11 here, midnight, 10 to midnight huh. here, so that it could be, I think, 8 to 10 in the morning in the UK, where it's a really, really, it's oh. not as big here. It's a really big sport there. That's why they did it so late at night. Yeah. And it was kind of cool to see the, the lights of the strip. Um, really yeah. enjoyed that. I, so I like F1. I'm not a big sports fan, but that I do like. Yeah. The fun I'm, not a, I'm, I'm not a huge, I'm not a big sports fan. You know, I don't go out of my way to watch it, but um, I enjoy sports. Like I was in the BYU marching band and I was in my huh. high school marching band and I enjoyed watching the football games that I was at, but I, I never really watched a game that I wasn't at, you know? <laughs> yeah. Didn't go out of my way I, while I was there. Yeah. It was, it was a lot of fun. I loved it. And, um, I like, I like to, I wish sometimes I could just drive as fast as I could. So I, I like that. It's fun. So I would, I would love to be that close to an F1 race. Um, yeah, not enough. Wouldn't love it enough to stick around. Oh, yeah, and you, you in Vegas, and I had to get back anyway. I, I, I'm not a big fan of drunks. <laughs> That's just a, one of the problems if you spend downtown yeah. Vegas at a sporting event. You're dealing with a lot of intoxicated people, and I'm, I don't have patience for people that uh, that do a lot of things that take them out of my world. I'm, I'm sorry if you if you need to drink a lot and you need to do drugs or something. I don't want you in my life because. I just don't have the patience for you. Uh, yeah. And one thing I do watch, though, and I watch MMA, mixed martial arts, uh, uh, because, and people laugh at me, go, oh, that's not true. I go, yeah, it's research. If you're going to write fight scenes, if you watch some of those fights, you'll see some, um, you'll see the, you'll see the total, ex I mean, you'll see extreme examples of what the human body is capable of. And mm -hmm. what the human body can absorb, uh, and it really is phenomenal when you watch those young men and women uh, battle it out in the octagon. And and you and, you, and I, when I write a fight scene, I don't write gratuitous fight scenes. Uh, it's kind of like cursing in my books. My life, I curse. My wife, I don't curse a lot. My wife does probably more than I do. She's higher temper uh -huh. than I am. But uh, I'm writing. Roman legionaries, they're tough men, they're living life, they have to be irreverent, yeah. they have to, so they cuss in my books, but they cuss in Latin, uh -huh. because I'm just not comfortable with, 
writing curse words in my books. Uh, the same thing with the fight scene. I don't care for gratuitous fight scenes, but there's a lot of my books. But within the fight scenes, I choreograph them so that this is happening and that's happening. I try to build tension between strikes and between clashes of shields uh, by by going internally into one of the characters or bringing up prior training. I might stop a fight scene in the middle to bring up prior training, especially with my Cretan Archer, because he started at a young age learning lessons about fighting. So mm-hmm. uh, he uh, he's fun to write because he'll stop and his, his uh, mentor will come up in his mind and say, hey, remember to do this, that, and have a, he'll replay, he'll relive a little scene of where he learned a lesson. Then we're back to the fight scene, and a few moves later, that lesson comes to fruition, and he uses it to defeat the guy. So it's kind of, I, I, I like the fight. Again, I'm, I'm in the scene when I'm writing it, like I'm, like I'm playing in a video game. So I like to have a little more depth to my fight scenes. Uh, and I don't ever use dialogue to kill time. For me, if it's, dial- if it's in a dialogue, it's going to come up later or it's moving mm-hmm. forward. Uh, it's not. It's just, it's writing adventure and history is my goal. To two tracks. You can read it for the adventure. You can read it like Pulp Fiction, uh, like a pulp magazine, just boom, action, action. Here we go, boom, boom. Or you can slow down a minute and realize that, for instance, uh, there's a fight scene at a, uh, a grain grinding facility. You take uh, a water wheel. We think of a water wheel as being up and down, right? It's uh-huh. a vertical. It's in the water. That the bo- water's at the bottom of the wheel. Well, yeah. they didn't have the gearing back then to transfer the power down into a grinding stone. So the grinding stones of that era were all laid horizontally in the water, and the water flowed by and turned the wheel, and the grinding was, millhouse was right above it, so that it had a direct turning of the grinding stones. So sometimes it's not new stuff you find for historical fiction and to build the scenes in the world. Sometimes it's the earliest invention of something, not what it, not what everybody thinks of it is. So those uh-huh. are, those are always fun to find too when you're when you're doing one of the books and you're building the world with the research and looking around like, well, everybody knows this, but let me take it back two steps earlier, a couple decades earlier when they didn't have that. And uh, talking about fighting, yeah. am I going on too long? I'm, I'm, no, I, I, I mean I have I have thoughts but i talk while you're no. still saying Tell something me. great i don't want to stop you no no i'm good um, and i think my camera dropped some time ago but um no so i like i'm i'm thinking about um i technically have written a few fight scenes i mean not not really i i, I so i have um this is the Grand Hill Chronicles podcast. It is yes. named after the Grand Hill Chronicles, which is a work in progress, or I guess a work on pause, um, that I started in 2010 under NaNoWriMo. Okay. And to date, I'm only like 34,000 words in to the, to the narrative that I've written. But I've, that's because I've been learning how to approach writing a novel. Are you, and I, are you a pastor or are you an outliner? Yes. Uh, <laughs> both. Um, I love that. So I, I put the Grand Hill Chronicles on pause because I am currently making a switch to being a full-time author without having any books published first. And so I'm like, I care too much about the Grand Hill Chronicles and I'm going to be too careful with that in order to make sure that what I push out fits the aesthetic that I have in my mind. Um, and so I, I put it on pause and I turned my attention and I wrote something else. Good. Uh, good. So right now I have, uh, I'm sitting on nightshade unicorn is the name of this other series. I wrote book one, uh, wrote, I, I finished writing the first draft about a month ago. And, uh, now I'm, I'm, going through learning how to publish it and publicize it 
And so like I, I've started serializing it on Kindle Vela. Oh, nice. Um, and I'm going to I'm going to serialize it on in audio as well. Actually, I think um by the time listeners are hearing this, it has already been begun in audio. Nice. Like I'm I'm thinking I'm thinking so I have a a software called Descript. Mm-hmm. Uh Descript comes with Squadcast. We're talking through a um, this uh, platform called Squadcast right now. Um, Descript has the capability of modifying and generating with AI. And so I I can throw my manuscript into the Descript software and generate an AI voice narration. And it's not free. I pay for Descript. Yeah. Um, but I, I, I actually have it modeled in my voice. And so it sounds kind of like a robot version of me because it doesn't have all the same inflections. Yeah. Um, so, you know, Kindle, Kindle Vela has rules. Yeah. You can share up to like 5,000 words outside and those, those first 5,000 words or whatever can be in the first three episodes. That's the free portion of the story. Yeah. Beyond that has to be behind a paywall. You can have it elsewhere besides just Kindle Vela, but it has to be behind a paywall. But so it, I'm thinking, it can't be free. Right. So I'm thinking to push out, uh, just like those Kindle Vela three episodes, I'm going to push out three episodes of this podcast with story narration. Um, nice. And it'll be those first three segments of Nightshade Unicorn book one. Uh, and then I'm going to serialize the rest of the book in audio. And I haven't figured out exactly how I'm going to share that yet with paying subscribers, you know, mm-hmm. um, perhaps via uh, Patreon or, or, um, and, or, uh, what's it called? Substack. I think they both, anyway, so there are ways to share with with paying subscribers. Sure. Um, and that, that might be nice for, for my funnel as well. Like, and I'm going to include that of course, again, so looking at a calendar, if I share these three, um, first segments of nightshade unicorn, or if I have already done so by the time this episode that we're talking in comes out, yeah, then this episode will come out December. Uh, 14th. Um, so today for, for listeners, just for your information, for us, it's November 21st. Um, yes. So I'm, 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 I've, I haven't written this down anywhere yet, (laughs) but I've been planning it and I've already, I've already produced the audio for the first two segments. Actually, no, the first three, but I need to split because the, the second one is anyway, too long. Um, well, have so you I've already, have you started your email list yet? Technically, yes. <laughs> no, technically, no, it's, it's fine. I have a it's newsletter fine. in uh, good, but good. no, like I have not. That's something that I need to focus on in December. Um, well, I have a very small newsletter list. I have I started it really late, and I don't. My writing schedule is such that I don't have time to stop and write. I'm a slow writer, okay? But I produce quickly because I worked long hours at it. Uh, I, I don't have the ability to stop, and I wouldn't know where to write, start, uh, to write a novella to give away in exchange for email addresses. So mm-hmm. I have it in my front, of, in front and the back of my books. If you want to join my newsletter, I do my newsletter once a month. Uh, and I always started out with uh, a bit of history. So there's a history bit at the beginning, and then I go into, uh, I call it words from my sponsor, which is my books, you know, updates on my books, whether one's coming out on audio or one's a uh, new one's coming out or an update on this last sales report from the last ones. So it, it's, uh, but for you at your stage, very important to capture those emails and, and to get it and get that newsletter going. I always tell people when I was a sales manager, I tell people you get your get your pipes, 
to handle the flow. Get those mm-hmm. set up before you need them. Like get in the habit of doing a newsletter before you have a before you have twenty thousand people waiting waiting for it. Get yeah. in the habit of putting out that newsletter so that when you do have twenty five hundred, three thousand people, you're already doing it. You're going like like my newsletter, I tell people I laugh, I go, it's only going to less than a hundred people. But I write it like it's going to 10,000 people. I want it to have that kind of, you're going to open my newsletter, you're going to see some history. And, and so, and the people that follow, and I don't lose, I don't lose many people. The people that do find me, do sign up, they stick around because they like the little history hits that I put in the beginning of the, the newsletter. But yeah, you, your situation, you want to have that, you want to start cap, capturing those and getting that newsletter out and working your newsletter muscles, if you will. Because yeah. as busy as you are, you know for a fact it's hard to sit down and write a newsletter, right? Yeah. It, yeah. Everything takes time. Everything takes, and it's not just time. And it's hard to explain to people that aren't writers, that aren't balancing a business like we are, which is a full time author business. Uh, everything I think has to be designed for marketing or creating a book, or creating an ad. Uh, uh, and it's a lot of share of mine, and there's only so much thought to go around. Uh, uh, and that's what, that's what I do, is make sure that I got the muscle. I'm working my newsletter every month. Once a month, I stop what I'm doing, I write the news. So that's, that's just my, my advice from me. And the only advice I ever give to people is the stuff I do, or stuff I've tried. Because I... I know too many people that want to give advice and I go, where did that come from? That's, that's weird. Uh, yeah. Do you, are you familiar with the writer dojo? Oh yeah. I listened to that. Love they, them. they're, I like their, um, their bad writing advice. Oh, episodes. those are funny. Those are great. Those uh, are great. Thing. I, I can't, I can't endorse the, the mocking voice that oh, Larry makes when he reads the, them. It's, but it's so really irritating. funny. So it's really funny. Um, and it's it's a good point to realize that not all advice is good advice, and you're going to hear some things, and you, you have to ask like, is that actually valid? Is that effective? Is, does that make any sense? And basically, whenever I see any anything that says rules for writing, I'm instantly skeptical. Yeah, you have um, to be. Yeah, and th- there are some that are that are actually valid, and it's a collection, of course. They say rules, but they that's from the standpoint of rules are made to be broken. Um, where, for example, they say never start a book with a dream sequence, but some people have done it and it has worked, you know? So, yeah, but they're, whenever they say like absolute rules for writing, yeah, no. Well, starting... For instance, starting a dream sequence or ending a chapter with a character going to sleep. This is the other one they talk about, don't do. Well, Mm. one is a crutch and the other is a stylistic endeavor, right? And and if it's that's your style. Narrative point. Like this is what's going on. This is a scene and the character goes to sleep. That's obviously the end of that scene because the POV character is not Ving. Yeah. Or, but then there's the other school of thought that said you should end a chapter with enough question and drive and interest so that your reader goes, ah, I need yeah. to know what happens next. Yeah. yeah so you go, to, you get into that sort of thing. What, what, uh, I, I explain to people about writing advice and it comes this way, writing and, and, and marketing advice, they're all the same concept. And the concept is this, what is the best exercise in the world? simple it's the one you'll do mm-hmm. so if somebody says well yeah. you should do this and this for marketing you go hold on does it fit your style is it real hard work for you to do that like i i couldn't do tiktok yeah i was about to mention tiktok <laughs> i i'm interested to get into tiktok i haven't done it because i uh, will not install tiktok on my phone i want to get a separate phone Never put my real name on it. I'm not giving that to China. Yeah, that's um, the problem. That is a problem. But at this, another thing, like I, I don't know if I'd be great on TikTok. You would probably do well because you have a presence. You have a very calming presence that mm-hmm. lends itself to intellectualism. 
So you would do well on there. My challenge is, and I've done a number of videos, uh, I've taken my camera, I've wrote a script, I've taken my camera, and I've, I've memorized the script and I read it as I panned my books and I panned, and I, and I did 10, 15 second, 12 second video. It takes me forever. So for me, because I don't have any editing software, and even if I did, do I want to take time to edit a video and do it two or three times a day to feed the algorithm on TikTok? It's not my style. Now you sound like you've got a really good handle on the on the uh, on the technical aspect of it. You may find a way to quickly crank out, you know, with AI and some other stuff. You may be able to crank out a lot of a lot of videos for TikTok, and that would make you a TikTok star. And you can do that. Mm -hmm. uh, my readers have a tendency to be older, and my readers are male and female both. I have a lot of female readers, and it always surprises me because uh, one of the things is if remember at twenty books people would have. Uh, urban fantasy, female write, uh, fiction. You see a lot of women would have female fiction on their badges. Yeah. So uh -huh. female fiction is a thing. Did you see anything that said guy fiction? <laughs> no. Or male fiction? No, there's no such thing as male fiction. It's not a category people think about. Yet I write. There, there, are, there are genres whose readers are largely male, but that's. Yeah, but, but the male fiction is not a thing. Uh, I guess there's a uh, male action adventure and it's, it's just an ob such an obscure category that have any value to it, but I write guy fiction. My books are, there aren't a lot of women in my books. Uh, my books are fast paced. If you want to be fast paced, they're slower. There's not, there's no sex. Uh, the cursing I said is very little of it. In later books is less of it because the characters are higher up in the thing. And one speaks Greek, and I hadn't take. I didn't want to take time to to translate all those words into Greek. I, I, my Latin's good, I, so there's less cussing in the later books in Latin. But you you've got so much going on in a book that you can't you just can't do everything. You have to know where you're going with it. And I lost my train of thought in case you didn't notice. <laughs> no, we were, we were talking about how do we get to TikTok. Oh, we were talking about um, marketing. Oh, different marketing different. And, and whether that that uh, exercise is one that you would do, you know, it's yeah. whether it's is it the exercise you, you would do. It's you, you know, my wife and I uh, we were both married before and when we met. We were both very cautious about getting involved in another relationship. You were talking about the the emotional toll of a bad relationship or a relationship on the rocks or or even a rough patch. Uh mm -hmm. To me, it locks me up. I can't get anything else accomplished until I get my uh, mm -hmm. my relationship in order. Because home to me is very important. Uh, so when I'm home, it's got to be a safe space. And if I have to fight for every little thing in a house, it's not worth it. And I'm pretty self-sufficient. Uh, but my wife and I, we just had our um, 29th anniversary on the uh, back in the 18th. And... Mm -hmm. And we were talking about congratulations. Thank you. Uh, we were talking about is this hard? And the truth is, it's not. Uh, it's not hard for me. And it's not hard for because the things I do for her naturally, she appreciates, and the things she does for me naturally, I appreciate. And we both think we don't do enough for the the other person. So mm -hmm. it's that kind of thing. Like if it's not to me, if it's not if you don't mesh, if you're not in stride moving forward together it's not comfortable it's just yeah. not good well and that's it, it's it's more a question of um being the right, right person not finding the right person uh true or is the, that's that's something that that people say and i can see that and i think um something that's been difficult for me is trying to figure out who i need to be because the, the Marine Corps asks for one thing and I want to be a good Marine and, and, uh, you could say a good employee and, and do my job. But when they want so much at the end of the day, I, I like my family is more important and that's, uh, if I'm getting pulled two different ways, well, 
the the trouble is well and we also had we had my mother-in-law come to live with us a few years ago when she was no longer able to take care of herself so that's stress that's stress on a relationship so right much there. stress and it it ate so much time from my wife during a time when we had a new baby and uh and then i i was reaching a a point in my career where it was time to 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 move on or perhaps see my career stall so i i moved on i i left the band and uh, that was it's been good and bad uh because one i got my nights and weekends ah, and holidays it's you part know, of my like, part of my story right i have I worked a holiday since I left the band? I, I don't know. But back in the band, I worked so many holidays and a lot of weekends. And it was, um, if you like sit there and tally hours, uh, I wasn't like on the clock an inhumane number of hours, but there's the question of, oh, am I working that night? I don't know. Um, Oh, this is this is clear. Oh, wait, nope. A gig just came up, and uh, trying to plan things with my family was difficult, and and then also the the hours on the clock. Um, it's not really equitable if you have to commute twice in the same day. Mm -hmm. Um, John, but Fulk. um, yeah. Or if you if you work if you work on Saturday, but it's only to go to a parade. And so you work like four hours, you work a half day on Saturday. And so then they cut you, they cut you loose four hours early. It was never four hours early, but if they cut you, if they cut you like two hours early on Monday, that's not, that doesn't equate to having worked two hours extra because you had to commute both on Saturday and on Monday. And so it, it all adds up to being away from home more well it, it is um and so like yeah all this this being pulled two different directions is very stressful yeah especially uh, if you're trying to do a creative endeavor in there on top of that right and trying to set up a full-time business as a writer get your products marketed and move forward by the way i'm sure john philip Sousa would have been very proud of you for what you pulled so <laughs> For anybody who doesn't know, John Philip Sousa was the director of the uh, President's Own, the Marine Corps Band, and yeah. wrote a number of uh, famous marches. I've played a lot of Sousa. <laughs> and you know what? I I um I didn't get as tired of Sousa as a lot of Marines do. Really? Like yeah. I could I could happily play Sousa again and again. Me too. Um, I, I would temper that and say it depends, <laughs> depends on which march we're playing. Um, but I, I forgot why it came up uh, as far as being pulled different directions. Um, well, if you're working, but, like you said, yeah. you're working split hours, you're commuting t two ways on two different days. Uh, I, like I said, I worked nights, weekends uh, when I was a sales manager. And it left me no time for creativity. Uh, knock on wood, my wife was an only child, so she's pretty good on her own. Uh, I worked very hard to make up for being emotionally absent because of my writing, mm -hmm. because I'm locked in my writing room most days, uh, all day long, doing something, doing marketing, writing a piece for here. Uh, I put my dog in my ads. So when I went to 20 books and I was Never. talking to people and I said something about my marketing and everybody were going, oh, how's Delilah the rescue dog? I went, okay, my dog is more famous than I am. So <laughs> yeah, it happens. Well, we've, gotta use that. we've always you rescued dog And a one-eyed cat. <laughs> there you go. How can we, how can we use that one-eyed cat? You, oh. you listen, people love, I love my dog. Uh, she's getting older. We've always adopted uh, rescue dogs that had issues, medical issues, abusive issues, and we've had to teach them what love and, and, and safety and environment and steady food and 
It's just, um, I mean, replace the, we have a den in the other part of the house. We replaced the flooring in there because one of our dogs was, wife took her, took her, took Emmy to the vet and said, Emmy, she's not urinating. There's something wrong with her kidneys. I know I'm, uh, she's going to yeah. die. I was, did, did a test on her. He said, I got news for you. Emmy is uh, urinating somewhere. We just got to find out where. Well, we found out where. She was in the den behind the desk in the other room. She, she poor little girl, ruined the carpet because obviously she had been abused when she urinated. And so she would hide to do it, wait for the middle of the night and go. So, you know, that's the story. It took a, after a while, she found out when we went outside, she could go outside and then nobody bothered her and she was good. But it mm -hmm. took a year to teach her. And but we got new flooring in the den. My wife was happy about that. <laughs> yeah. Oh, poor thing. So you, you, you have an animal, put the animal in your ads when you start doing ads. Or in my case, I do a lot of Facebook ads because that's where my audience is. My audience tends to be a little younger. I mean, a little older. Uh, uh -huh. And it's funny, when I first started, Facebook was the young thing, right? Now it's the old thing. TikTok is the young thing. And we something's going to come up next. There's, you know, Twitter's been... I tried Twitter for a while. I would send out tweets. I would t retweet other people and all that. I never got any traction there. Never felt like it was, it yeah. was really doing anything for me. So again, every social media... It's what you like to do, what you enjoy doing, what isn't a strain to you. You'll do it naturally and you'll just do it. And when Facebook post, I have an idea for a Facebook post I put together. Now, I break all the rules for Facebook post because my Facebook posts are like 400 words long. So I do an opening with me having a discussion with Delilah about what we're trying to talk about. And then I do an excerpt from the book. And I put whole whole section from the book in there because if you write historical fiction in a certain time period if your readers have a lot of options and and they go i don't know if i want to read historical fiction from this guy but i like uh, uh scotch highlander historical fiction well you're not going to like my stuff because high highlanders always have the 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 sexy highlander and the poor dame in trouble but uh so I give people a long sample of what I write, because if you're curious about what I write, you read that sample, you're going to at least have a feel good. You know what? I'll give uh -huh. this book a look. So that's one of the things I do that kind of breaks the rules. Again, all the rules are there. What works for you, what's comfortable for you, that's the one you go for. So it's... Uh, yeah. I like being I like being a full time writer. This is the best job I've ever had, bar none. Yeah, yeah, and I I have enjoyed writing, and so I I just finished a, a Skillbridge internship. Um, the DoD has a program called Skillbridge that allows it it may allow a service member to participate in an internship or a training program during the last few months on active duty. And um, during the internship, I had a daily word count goal. And that was stressful because I felt beholden, beholden to, to meet it. Uh, not just because it's important to get the writing down, but because I was on, I was under this, the roof of this program, you know, this was my job like this is why i wasn't showing up for work for the marines during these couple of months mm -hmm. so i got to make mission you know <laughs> and and so that was really stressful and i um i for book two i think i'm going to have the same daily word count goal but if I find a patch where I need to do some more planning before I write through it, I'm going to do stop and do that planning before I write through it. Because uh, with book one, it was very stressful. And I, uh, I have concerns. Like I, I don't feel great about all the scenes that I wrote when I had to meet the word count goal. So I had to keep writing, even though I felt like I wanted to stop and do some planning. You ask if I, um, if I do planning or pantsing, and I, I do both. Um, I like to have 
excuse me, I like to have an idea in my mind of what I'm going to write. And I'm not used to uh, writing if I don't have that idea in my mind. And that's exactly what I had to do during during this Skillbridge I, I internship. Have, I have a friend of mine named uh, T.R. Harris. He's a science fiction writer. A T.R. Harris cannot write unless he's under the deadline of a, uh, a, a, a pre-order. He can't. He just can, that. He cannot focus his Deadlines, mind on what he, yeah. he He sets a pre-order and then lollygags, if you will, thinking about the book. Think about He thinks about the book, thinks about the book, and then he sits down and he writes it. Now, in the Navy, he was a, uh, he was a journalist in the Navy. So he's uh -huh. used to putting facts together in his head and building story from just a little bit of information, building the story out, uh, the narrative out. So he write, but he's also a perfectionist. And he finds that if he has too much time to write it, he'll write it, then start going back and changing. And he'll change this, so that has to be changed. And this has to be changed. And he ends up with this rolling changes going through the whole thing that aren't making it better. It's just changes to make changes. Me, I'm a slow writer. I, I take, I give myself six months on pre-order and I usually write the book in three months because I do a, I do waypoints. Uh, I have historical guidelines and then I have historical events that happen. Uh, for instance, in this last book I wrote, Cornelius Scipio, uh, before he went back to Rome and left Iberia, once he run, ran Carthaginians out of the uh, the, the territory, uh, formed uh, Italia, Spain, uh, mm -hmm. for as a, uh, a home for his veterans. And so I wrote a piece where how he got that piece of land he used. Mm -hmm. uh, and it was fun to fill in the blanks. I didn't know I was going to write that when I started. I didn't know what I was going to do with Italia. I just knew that he had been. Matter of fact, a couple hundred years later or so, some of the emperors came from that city that he founded in Spain. Uh, and it was a good piece of bottom land. It was between two rivers. I mean, it was, it was nice. So to me, it was given to him. I I'll do a quick scene. Uh, he runs off the Carthaginians and he's got the tribes that were allied with the Carthaginians. It was actually Mago Barca, who was uh, Hannibal's younger brother, who he ran off. Uh, and, and now he's the general of the legions, and the, tr the local tribes are coming to him and going, hey, let's have a peace treaty. And he's like, yeah, let's do a peace treaty. Let's not fight. This is not one, one the, the chief of the tribe and we don't know who the chiefs were. I had to make them up. The chief of the tribe uh, where I tell you was located uh, says to him, I don't know if I can make peace with you. And he says, why not? I mean, are there going to be war between us? He said, no. He said, all wars fought over land. My young bucks think it's about uh, pride. And some people think it's inheritance. And some people think it's about titles. But it's all fought over land. So if we're going to have peace, I have to give you land because you conquered. And Cornelius says, well, look, give me symbolic land. I'll take symbolic land. And the chief gets irate and he says, that's, you're going to insult the dignity of my dead warriors? I said, no, you've got to have land comparable to what you accomplished by defeating my people in four different battles. Uh, so he gives him this piece of land on these two rivers. And I... I just, that was a historical fact. He had land there. I didn't know what I was going to do with it, but I created a scene so he had the land. Well, late in the book, he finds out that he needs to do something with his veterans. So he gives them Italia, he gives them the land, and he helps them build the city, and, and that's it. Well, there's two historical facts that I put together with a story between them. And, and that's why I love historical fiction, linking stuff like that. Yeah. Uh, but I didn't know I was going to write that when I wrote it. But I do a lot of research before I start writing. So in my head, I've got this happens, that happens. How does it go together? Let me logically, what's the, my whole thing has got to be logical. 
Why this to that to this? Uh, and that's why I don't understand historical, what do they call that? Alternate history. People that write oh. alternate history, I don't understand that there's so much going on in history itself. Uh, for instance, you're dealing with uh, polythe polytheologic, poly you know, multiple gods, right? Uh -huh. pagan, pagan society with multiple gods. Uh, the Romans had a god for everything. And minor, they had minor and minor gods. One of my favorite was uh, Cumulus. Cumulus was the god of stupid. And, and in one scene, these two thugs, my, my, uh, my character in the Clay Warrior stories is in a bathhouse and he's been uh, on the road and he's tired and, and he's a fighter. He's a legionary fighter that grows up to become a battle commander. Um, but not a council because all the councils in my books are real people. So he can only get so high in my books. That's why my series ended at 19 books. He couldn't hmm. get any higher. So they come into the bathhouse and they lock the door and he looks at him and he goes, have you been worshiping at the altar of Comus? And they go, we're not stupid. Uh. Of course, he kicks one in the water because it's a bathhouse and he beats uh -huh. the other one up. Then he pulls the other one out and beats him up. And he walks outside and he sells the bathhouse at 10 and he says, you got big cleanup going on. In there. You're going to have to drain. You're going to have to drain the pool. Uh, that was just a, a, a God that you throw out to help create that for them, because to them, that was something they got of stupid. Uh, Sticulus, which is a god of manure. And, and people go, ha, 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 a god of manure. But like, no, it was an agrarian society. Manure was very important to them. That was yeah. their fertilizer, right? Uh, even Rome had one of the first uh, sewer systems. And so I consider that probably the biggest temple ever built in the world, right? The <laughs> So they built it for the god Sticulus. So, you, you know, how do you how do you take that? And at times, you I had somebody got mad at me once because I I think I made a joke about Sticulus because you know in the Marine Corps you know if you're going to the if you're going to the the head you're going to make a comment about how good your feet was you know I did the mighty turd or something like that. Okay. And so I made had a legionary make a joke about worship you know. Making a deposit, you know, a sacrifice for Sticulus. Yeah. And somebody said, oh, no, the Romans were very serious about their gods, and you can't joke about that. And I went, obviously, you've never been in combat or with a bunch of Marines. <laughs> it gets crazy, and there's nothing you can do about it. So that's, yeah. that's all part of the whole world building thing, if we think about the different societies and different ways that people do. And so well, I, I think we're at. We should probably cut it off. We, it's been a longer conversation. Um, actually, I'm thinking I'll probably take the kind of the first half, okay, as one episode, and the second half as another episode where we talked about um, work-life balance and okay and marketing. So good. Did, did I do good then? Yeah, yeah, great. Awesome. I, thank you. It was a awesome. great conversation. Um, we do need to tell listeners where they can find you on the web. On the web is very and easy. I, J Clifton Slater dot com. It's J Clifton C L I F C L I F T O N. J Clifton Slater S L A T E R. And it's very simple. And be right. sure you send me links to this when you put it up, because I'll share it on my my personal Facebook page and on my uh, my book page. Okay, and, and we'll get we'll, do. we'll get a little pop, we'll get a little um, hopefully get you a little uh, popularity for it. Yeah, okay. yeah, absolutely. And and my um, it almost came up, so I'll mention uh, my my novel that I wrote um, is first in a series. The series is called Nightshade Unicorn, and I'm pushing towards launching February 28th. Nice, um, but subscribers, uh, not podcast subscribers, but you know, if you can find me on Ream Stories or on. Uh, I do have a Patreon, but I, I have I I need to build out my infrastructure really. Um, but those subscribers will be able to read it early if they want to. So. Nice, very nice. Well, look, it's been a pleasure being on the is it yeah Grand, Grand Hill Chronicles podcast yeah yeah with Don Bishop and thank you for coming on. I really appreciate talking to you. It was, it was absolutely a pleasure.
Good luck to you. Thank you.